uh, yeah, when I was told that uh, Hans will deliver a talk on Nusantara, he re reminds me very much of Gajah Mada nearly a century ago when he said, I shall not rest until I have you unified the entire Nusantara. And Nusantara has been known by uh, various names. Um, was, was also known as Mafilindo. It was a coinage by uh, Makapagal and Skarno. And uh, later on by Sultan Takde Ali Shabana, Professor Sultan Takde Ali Shabana, who renamed it as Bumantara, Antara Bumi. Nusantara is Antara Nusa. And Mafilindo, you know, it stands for the three countries. <clears throat> so, 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 so today, I, as I told Bahans, I suspect he could be a reincarnation of, of Gajah Mada, and he will present us what his notion of Nusantara is. Bahans, please. Chairman, uh, distinguished uh, professors, Command uh, Imam Akrab, and uh, uh, participants of this uh, meeting, I have been uh, a frequent visitor to these uh, Malaysian Studies uh, conferences, uh, not uh, from the first, but I think from the third one onward. And if I couldn't make it last uh, two years ago, uh, my wife came in sin. So thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm greatly uh, honored to be um, invited to give this keynote address. Uh, and I'm, of course, also honored and amused at the same time to be called an incarnation of Gajamada. <laughs> Well, in, in, incarnations, of course, can happen uh, anywhere in, in many guises. So w why not should uh, Mat Saleh become Gajamada? <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, my uh, talk is called uh, uh, Malaysia uh, and uh, the Nusantara, or the Nusantara and Malaysia. Uh, and I will briefly. Uh, explain what the agenda is that I try to push. Now, the agenda of this uh, conference, uh, as we read in the conference papers, is uh, looking at the nine challenges of Fawasan uh, 2020 um, and uh, explore the intellectual dimensions uh, of these uh, nine challenges. <clears throat> now, you, you will have read uh, all the nine challenges. Uh, that are important uh, according to uh, its creator, uh, ex-Prime Minister Mahathir, to bring Malaysia on the path towards a fully developed industrial society. But alas, there is one challenge that is missing, and that is the challenge, access to resources, sustainable governance of resources. Maybe that was not on the agenda internationally at the time he pronounced uh, his uh, Vavasan, uh, but uh, nowadays, of course, it is. So um, I will focus on this uh, topic of access to resources in general, and more specifically, the resources that are buried in and under the South China Sea. Now, uh, the question will be, how can Malaysia get access to these resources of the South China Sea that are contested? And uh, once uh, this question comes up, who will actually govern the South China Sea? And last but not least, what can Satoan Science uh, Social Malaysia do to uh, take part in this tense part of the Wawasan Tuapulu Tuapulu. 
Now, perhaps uh, uh, it's uh, something that everybody knows, but you need to remind it that Malaysia is, in fact, a maritime state. Uh, it has long borders, more than 4,500 kilometers. 63% uh, uh, of the borders are maritime borders. Uh, historically, of course, we all know, you know that uh, there were very important maritime states. Malacca, Trenganu, Johor, they all were Malay sultanates based on connection between land and sea, exchanging products and shipping them abroad. Uh, Socioculturally, the Malays, and this is quite often forgotten, were uh, a very important seafaring community. And last not least, most migrants that nowadays live in Malaysia have come from overseas. <laughs> Maritime economy contributes a large share to GDP in terms of shipping, shipbuilding, fishing, and other maritime pursuits. But what bothers me, especially teaching courses here, talking to students, talking to my friends, there is a general lack of consciousness of the maritime position of Malaysia. Uh, generally, um, if I talk to my friends and said, well, let's go to the beach and have some fun. They said, oh, no, why not go to the market you know, eat there? You know? They don't like to swim. They don't like to take up sailing. Uh, they, nev they, have, they are good in badminton, but never in sailing or rowing. <coughs> so uh, there is an underdeveloped maritime consciousness. And even here uh, in... Uh, the east coast of Malaysia, which is very close to the South China Sea, things could be more active. But uh, there are some exceptions. Uh, there is definitely not enough maritime research. Now, uh, some a uh, uh, couple of years ago in uh, University uh, Science Malaysia, we created an index. We were talking about the question of indicators uh, of the maritime potential of nations. And uh, this is a map showing that uh, the darker, the bluer it is, the greater is the maritime potential in terms of coastlines, in, in terms of uh, shipping, in terms of uh, maritime population. So Philippines uh, and uh, Malaysia, Indonesia are really the ones that rank highest on this index of maritime potential. If you look at the maritime economy, uh, a similar index that measures uh, the contribution of maritime economy to the economy overall, Indonesia ranks very high, Malaysia is sort of in the middle, but strangely enough, Brunei and Philippines, despite their potential, are very low on this indicator. So they are uh, Indicators may be right or wrong, but at least they give you a sort of hint where interesting problems lie. So here we have uh, a maritime economy, we have a great potential. What is being done, especially in the field we are concerned with in research? Malaysia. Well, this is a usual uh, image that uh, people have of Malays. Uh, they're Kampong boys. Maybe there is some little bit of uh, maritime culture, uh, but not uh, very much. You know? <coughs> so this is a stereotype that uh, one always hears, and that is perpetuated in these nice cartoons by Bulat. Malaysia, a maritime state. Now, I was quite shocked uh, reading the newspapers uh, over the years. Uh, the national carrier, air carrier is mass, you know, so that was supported despite losses all along. But MISC, uh, the big shipping company, withdrew from the Grand Alliance of Container Shipping, the German Hapag Lloyd, Hap Japanese Nippon, Yagan, Kaisha, the big uh, conference liners. Uh, and if you're not part of a conference, you don't get the cargo coming in. 
uh, in November 2011, uh, the, uh, the line uh, withdrew from container shipping uh, altogether. I mean, containers are the life blood of an export nation. And the national sea line just withdraws. Well, I, I get worked up on this because uh, I started in a shipping company after doing my A-levels, and uh, I was a, a cadet, a midshipman in the German Merchant Navy, so uh, you know, I have some emotional ties to this. So I said, why do they do that? You know, and I can't understand it. Uh, also, there is no uh, Malaysian ocean policy. Well, there is. There is a paper, Malaysian Ocean Policy 2011-2020. I obtained a copy through, you know, if we, you have many students, you can also copies that are not published. Uh, it's a, a, quite an interesting document uh, trying to really develop an ocean policy for Malaysia, a maritime policy. However, this was never passed by parliament, now, let alone by the cabinet. So it's sitting there, gathering dust in uh, some ministries, uh, uh, in the, maybe in the planning department, in the prime minister's department. And uh, however, I mean, I, I also have my doubts when I look at this paper. The main proposal was to set up a new ministry of fisheries uh, and ministry of the seas. Well, maybe somebody is waiting for the next election and then needs another minister position to give away. So uh, anyway, uh, this ocean policy never came about. So ocean policy, governing the South China Sea, what is at stake? Well, if you look at a map of the claims to the South China Sea, it looks like a puzzle. It looks entangled, you know. It, it looks very, very difficult to understand. Just, I mean, following all these red, blue, yellow lines that everybody uh, of ASEAN, except for Laos and Singapore, have a claim to the South China Sea. And of course, the biggest claimant is the People's Republic of China. You see the red line going all the way, which is normally known as the uh, U-shaped line or the nine dash line. More about this later on. Now, uh, basically, there's no uh, problem because there is a convention, a United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea, that was uh, signed uh, um, in 1977 and uh, passed by most governments worldwide, including Malaysia, including China, all ASEAN states except Laos for obvious reasons, have signed it. But the one big player that has not signed it is, who knows? United States of America. Malaysia has signed it. So one of the big interesting parties meddling a lot in the South China Sea is not part to the international law of the sea. Now, uh, let me... Uh, give you some details uh, that uh, if anybody has uh, uh, studied law, please don't listen, but uh, for the others. Uh, uh, Article 2.1 says that the sovereignty of a coastal state extends blah, 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 to an adjacent belt of sea described as the territorial sea, not exceeding 12 nautical miles. So uh, all the laws that are uh, promulgated and applied to land areas of a state also apply to this 12-mile zone uh, uh, along the coastal areas. Now, this was extended by another 12 miles um, for some reasons, uh, but it's not very important. But um, the other line that is drawn is a 200-mile zone of the exclusive economic zone. And this is the important part of it. Uh, it does not mean it's part of your territory. Your laws do not apply to the 200 miles, but you have the exclusive right to anything that swims uh, or is found in the sea. 
from uh, sea urchins to uh, uh, sharks, but also to the oil and the gas under the sea. Uh, so this is now, uh, you know, energies is very important for the development of any country. So who gets the oil uh, is powerful. Uh, you see the transformation of uh, the state of Changanu after uh, oil came in. Uh, I still remember when I was doing field research in the 1970s, Changanu was a nice, quiet little state. But now, of course, since oil came in, Kumatua everywhere. Uh, now, uh, Kula Chengano looks like a little Singapore. Um, so uh, all these lines that you saw on this map refer to this exclusive zone. I mean, just a, a simple way you have these. Um, four different zones, uh, land, and then the two 12-mile uh, zones, and the 200 EEZ. But uh, as this is not territory of a state, all ships can pass through this EEZ, even through the territorial zone, the 12-mile zone. So this is from the old idea that the sea is free for everybody, free for traffic, for shipping. The right of innocent passage. Now, what, what does innocent passage mean? Uh, uh, it's, it's not uh, that the, the sailors, of, which, of whom I was one at one time, are innocent. <laughs> 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 Far from the truth. No, no. Uh, innocent is, uh, means that they are not warships. They, uh, if they are warships, they have to get permission to pass. So this is the case all the time through the Straits of Malacca. If uh, a warship of a foreign nation passes through the waters of Malaysia, they have to get permission. Now, um, there is, however, another article, and this is the crucial one on which I want to focus. And this says, where the coasts of two states are opposite or adjacent, there's a median line. So, uh, in terms of... Uh, um, I mean, we all remember our uh, third-year uh, lessons in school in mathematics, drawing a median line is, is not that difficult. Yeah? So in most cases, that works quite well. Uh, so if uh, there is a tanjong in one country and a tanjong in another one, then you draw a line, and the median line is where you separate the EEZ. Uh, it works in most areas, in the Atlantic, it works quite well, in the Baltic Sea. There have been, uh, all these lines have been fixed. Uh, if they were scoral as a, um, a court of law in Hamburg, so they settled this. So the line goes right in the middle. Uh, now, however, there are other points in the uh, law of the sea where uh, trouble arises. Now, uh, the median line. However, there can be historic reasons why you can deviate from this median line. There can be historic reasons. And that's what the Chinese government is banking on. Historical reasons. And of course they have a big advantage because the Chinese like to be bu we are bureaucrats even worse than the Germans. <laughs> they wrote everything down, and, and they prepared map, and so they have a lot of historical doc documents to prove their claim to the South China Sea. But th that's a tricky issue, I'll come back to that again. <clears throat> Another tricky issue is that, uh, what do you do when there are islands? Now, if there are big islands like Borneo, no problem, so the border between Malaysia and uh, Indonesia, median line, no problem. However, if there are sort of very small islands, if there are rocks, so uh, the law of the sea says rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own shall have no exclusive economic zone or continental shelf. Very clear cut. Well, however, what about the South China Sea? Now let me quote a seafarer 
in a novel, Joseph Conrad, Typhoon, he says that China sees North and South are narrow seas. They are seas full of everyday eloquent <laughs> facts, such as islands, sandbanks, reefs, swift and changeable currents, tangled facts that nevertheless speak to a seaman in a clear and definite language. To a seaman, but, but not to the bureaucrats in the, in the ministries. They get very confused, and what is an island, what is a rock, uh, becomes an issue because you can bank your claim to the resources of the science shown and see whether you own an island or a rock. <coughs> Joseph Conrad. Now let me take the issue of the Spratly Islands uh, that you find in Malay. They are called Kupula and Spratly. No, there is a Malay name, but it's not used, Kupula and Spratly. Okay, everybody has its own name for it. It's very confusing. Now, let me uh, just show you one uh, such island, Tito, which is uh, the second largest island in the Spreadleys, which is occupied by the Philippines. <coughs> now, they very nicely enlarge the island by putting a large runway in it on both sides. And they have uh, some people stationed there. So, okay, now it's an inhabited constantly inhabited island and claimed by the Philippines. Uh, you can uh, even extend this uh, to very absurd uh, types of actions. Chinese, Johnson Reef, they built on a rock, uh, a structure you can see you know, on the left uh, uh, picture. There was nothing before except shallow water, maybe a few inches at, uh, at high tide. They just put some concrete in. They put a few people, poor guys from PLA have to survive <laughs> there for months and months. Okay, it's now an inhabited island. So 200 miles around this island now belongs to Chinese economic zone. All the oil and gas. Great, huh? Well, Philippines, they're not as uh, quite as nice, uh, but uh, they put an old ship there sang it on the rock and put uh, a dozen of marines there every three months they're exchanged uh, so they live in this old wreck so thomas school is now an island occupied um, absurd okay so you have uh, now uh, the south china sea with different islands. Uh, there's also, there are also two islands in the Spratleys occupied by Malaysia. Um, I tried to find out details, but I couldn't. Um, and now the Chinese say, OK, we don't engage in all this coral. We just draw a line, the red dotted line. And this line uh, was uh, done. Uh, the first uh, map is was produced uh, just after the Second World War. Uh, and now the question is, is this now claimed as Chinese territory? You read this in the papers, uh, CNA, CNN, of, uh, of course, always talks about this. All oh, the Chinese claim this as their territory, and they want to have all the resources. Now, it gets pretty close to Brunei beaches. You know? So the belts of Brunei is now in Chinese territory. Well. Uh, it gets a bit further from Tenganu, but uh, it gets pretty close to Sabah and Sarawak. Yeah? So these are areas that have been used for fishing by Malay fishermen for centuries. Now, red dotted line. Who is uh, claiming the resources? Now let's uh, now look at this main point, the historical uh, perspective on the South China Sea, because according to international law, you can claim uh, your uh, islands and your territory through these economic claims. And uh, the Chinese are very busy uh, building up research capabilities, doing research projects, funding them, not so in Malaysia. Uh, now, uh, some of the scholars in China uh, take a different view and uh, have in fact said that this area in the nine dotted line is not Chinese territory, 
because that would not be tenable in international law, but they are historic waters. Again, historic waters. Yeah. So if by history, this is all you are, it's your, it's your lake, you know, your Danau, then of course uh, there's no question who has access to the resources. Uh, and uh, the uh, Chinese ministry uh, published a document, which I saw on, on, uh, uh, in one of their documents, where they uh, have all these uh, uh, historical claims. And they go back to 25 uh, AD, or to the Three Kingdoms. Uh, as some of you might know the Three Kingdoms from the Hong Kong uh, Cantonese uh, uh, Soap operas. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> you. So even then, there they say, "Oh, they had already uh, occupied these islands." Now, if I ask my linguist friends in Chinese studies, they say, "It's all bull. It's not true at all." You know, so these are general ideas that uh, when there are some heroes that traveled uh, over the seas to the south, but where exactly and what islands are meant? These are all inventions of the Foreign Affairs Department of China. Now, there has been a, a very uh, interesting debate. So, you know, I'm, I'm a sociologist, but as my sociologist friends are not interested in the South China Sea, I have to, to, to sit down and, and read all this uh, stuff, uh, um, like historical uh, literature. Now, there was a big debate, actually, on the South China Sea, whether this is a Mediterranean Sea. This is an important argument. Um, and um, like uh, Gang Wangwu, who is a famous Malaysian, Singaporean uh, histor uh, historian, he said, no, no, that's not a Mediterranean. It's part of a Pacific area. This is also the official uh, American position. It's not a Mediterranean Sea, but it's part of the Asia Pacific. Now, Asia Pacific, you know, is an extension of the coast of California. <laughs> so they, they also play this game of name giving. And then, OK, if it's part of the Pacific, that's our lake, that's our territory. So that, I mean, these uh, subtle and not so subtle battles of word are going on um, from a position of uh, interpretive uh, Sociology, it's quite interesting to look at the name giving of, of uh, the concepts that are developed. Uh, now, of course, uh, there are uh, some studies, uh, uh, in addition to the historians, uh, papers and reports uh, by MIMA in KL. Uh, there's a maritime research. Uh, one of the main maritime research centers is actually uh, University Malaysia Tenganu. Uh, which has several research units. And as we heard from the vice chancellor, his vision is to uh, say we cannot, in a smaller university, do everything, so we concentrate on maritime issues. So, so that's one uh, beacon of maritime research in Malaysia. Otherwise, not much. Now, uh, there is very limited research by social scientists. There are people who write in Orang Laut, uh, some anthropologists here and there, but South China Sea is not yet on the agenda. Except, uh, of course, one paper presented by Prof. Wan Sawawi recently. Um, well, just as a side remark, <coughs> my advice to students sitting for exams, PhD exam, if you can't answer a question in Germany, uh, you always say, well, Max Weber. <laughs> if it's in Malaysia, you say, well, either Shamsul Amri or Wan Sawawi. <laughs> so you're usually right because they've covered so many different fields. Okay, now, uh, uh, what would be a, a sort of a Malaysian perspective on the South China Sea? So I just want to float some ideas on this. And one of these ideas is, uh, let's forget about South China Sea. Let's uh, forget about Nanhai, the South Sea in Chinese. 
what about the concept of Nusantara, which is so important? It's a Malay Javanese concept. Now, uh, originally, it's supposedly derived from Sanskrit, Antara, meaning lying in between, lying adjacent, near, or Nusa Islands. So this designates an area that either includes or is between islands. Uh, that's a linguistic one. And the name is found in, in copper inscriptions from uh, the 14th century in some Javanese manuscripts. Uh, and uh, uh, so sporadically it turns up. Uh, it is uh, mentioned uh, in uh, the Oso, uh, famous Oath of Gajamada. Uh, as you know, I'm the uh, incarnation. Uh, <laughs> uh, the chief minister of Majapahit, who uh, says he will not enjoy his rice and curry. He can only eat the rice, but not the curry, until the Nusantara has been subjugated. So now there's a question, what includes this Nusantara? And there is uh, some evidence that in, in the Majapahit, it included the whole of the Java Sea, but also the southern part at least, if not the whole of the South China Sea. Because it included all the Karajaan and the, the um, Malay, uh, uh, like Kutai uh, and uh, Brunei and, and all the various places uh, also, uh, which is now Malaysia and uh, the Philippines. Uh, there, of course, there is no map, but uh, this uh, seems to be the case. It also turns up in the Siddhartha Malayu. Uh, I'm not, not a li linguist, but I, I looked through my copy I had at home, and uh, it uh, also refers to uh, Majapahit and says, you know, it refers to the Galarazaraza, Nusantara, Pula, Setengah, Takluk, Kepada, Baginda. So they are, they, low, they have allegiance to the ruler of Majapahit, and they are part of the Nusantara. Now, where the outer limits are is unclear. Now, I, I have looked into this conception of space, which is a topic, I think it's in my full paper, but I can't go into this here. Now, even uh, recently, Nusantara has been used, and there are writings uh, in Indonesia. Uh, Sukarno used it. Uh, in his speeches, um, and uh, the most interesting I found was looking into a dictionary. So I looked into the Kamus Dewan Bahasa in Indonesia, and there Nusantara is Indonesia. If you take the Kamus Dewan Bahasa Malaysia, it says Nusantara is in English the Malay word. So between these two countries, even Dewan Bahasa has a different conception. Uh, but historically, I think Devan Bahasa in Malaysia is correct. Uh, though in the nationalistic phase, Nusantara has also been used for sort of the Indonesia, but like Mafalindo was mentioned, including Malaysia, leading to confrontation. But what else in Malay literature, where does it turn up? What about speeches, early speeches of a Malaysian politicians, scholars. I, I tried to go through the literature, I didn't find anything. Nobody has ever written, apparently, anything about Nusantara. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So we have the concept of Nusantara maritime states in the Malay world. Srivijaya, Majapahit, and Malacca uh, the Javanese coastal states like Demak, uh, in contrast to, uh, say, Mataram or Solo or Jakarta. Then, of course, all the Malay Sultanates uh, along the South China Sea, from, from this one, from Chengadu to uh, Borneo to uh, Brunei, uh, and uh, the Eastern Islands. Now, my thesis would be that Nusantara is a socio-cultural concept which refers to a Mediterranean seas, including its islands and its littoral states. 
Now, don't, don't tell this to the Chinese government. I'll never get an invitation to China again. <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, if it comes to, to a legal battle about the resources of the South China Sea, you have claims and counterclaims, and you have to be well prepared. Malaysia experienced this uh, in this uh, Pula uh, Pedro in a, a rock island next to Singapore. Singaporeans, they had all the historical facts, and they won the case. Yeah. If uh, Malaysian Prime Minister's Department had done their homework properly, they might have won the case. Yeah. Sorry to say so, but uh, now <clears throat> cases can be based on historical evidence according to UNCLOS, the law of the sea. So somebody has to sit down and do the work. Uh, well, this thesis that this Nusantara is a Malay sea uh, and includes the South China Sea needs verification. So we have to do maritime research to actually do this. Uh, just uh, to do my duty to Brunei uh, Darussalam, I mean, this is still a functioning Malay kingdom with Kampung Aya in the Brunei River, with the Istana, with upriver, with the Masjid Nagara, and of course, His Majesty the Sultan, the absolute ruler of Brunei, living on resources, formerly forest resources, now on oil and gas in the South China Sea, in territory claimed by China, partly by Vietnam. Another point, of course, is now which way do I look to get the data that I need? Malay trade and seafaring. Of course, the Buginese, the Malacca Malays, Brunei Malays were all roaming the South China Sea as uh, fishermen, as seamen, as traders. And this is still going on today, um, or at least until a few years back when, when I was doing field research in Riau area in Eastern Indonesia, traveling on these wooden ships, partly sailing, partly already by motor. Uh, I sat in the evening and talking to these Juragan captains and they could explain to me all the currents, the way they were going, the points they were uh, looking for, the islands. They all had Malay names, including uh, Singapore. And I have to tell you this. I was <laughs> talking to one of these uh, sea captains. Uh, he was going, going from uh, Tanjung Pinang uh, to uh, exit Tenganu because his son was getting married in Tringano. They had all these, still these connections going. And I said, which way do you take? And they said, oh, this, this, and then, and then he said, and then I, I, we passed uh, the Raja Singapura. Uh, actually, excuse me. Yeah, Raja Singapura. Who's, who's the Raja Singapura? He said, oh, Lee Kuan Yew. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I mean, for him, uh, this whole area was still Nusantara, yeah. Well, it's Singapore, and then there was a Raja Singapore, and then there, there was another Raja, uh, and uh, the, the Sultan of Tenganu, and so on. You know, this, uh, and uh, all this is not documented because nobody has really done any serious research. So you cannot say uh, this spread list is called giving it a Malay name. We can guess it Kupula and Spratly, very weak argument. But I'm sure all these rocks, they are known to these sailors and fishermen. Uh, so uh, there is one problem that I ran into when I was looking into this. Uh, I mean, this is all very preliminary type of research, I'm telling you, uh, which I would call the great Malay maritime mystery. Yeah. Now, there are pantons and classical tests describing voyages. There are the uh, oral reports by uh, fishermen, by uh, sea captains that can tell you all, all this. But uh, going through the literature, I could not find any Malay map, no sea charts. Now, 
being an old sailor myself, I was got very disturbed, you know, how do they find their way? Again, one, one of these anecdotes, I asked one um, uh, of these uh, sea captain who had gone all the way on his small boat, partly sailing, partly to Australia, where they go ashore and they say, oh, we are shipwrecked, and they get support from the uh, Australian government and turn around and go home. <laughs> okay. I said, how do you find the way? I mean, there are reefs and so on. And, uh, uh, do you have any sea charts? Uh, he thought, of, oh, yeah, yeah, we have. Then he climbed down in his cabin, came back, and he showed me a little booklet. And it said, Atlas Skolach <laughs> so, so he had a, a school atlas, you know, with some maps, and, and this was, uh, was his sea chart, but otherwise, he knew the way because he had learned it from his father, from his uncle. Uh, you have to go to find this rock and then that rock and that current and then at this time of the year you, you get the wind from that direction and so on. He has all this local knowledge, yeah, including the names for all these rocks. So I think this would be a fantastic type of research for some of your PhD students to interview these Malay sea captains and ask them you know, for their voyages descriptions, names, to build up the historical evidence of the claim to the South China Sea. And by the way, I found one map. In, <coughs> it was mentioned in, a, in an article that there's a Buginese map. Buginese are big sailors. I went to a great uh, effort to get a copy of the map from, from London, from the archives. I looked at it. I immediately saw this was just a copy of an old uh, Dutch, Dutch map no original Buginese map. So Buginese and Malays, no maps. So this has something to do, from a sociological point of view, with a certain conception of space. The Malay conception of space is such that it does not lend itself to Euclidean space in terms of sea charts and maps. The other thing is, of course, migration uh, across the South China Sea. Now there are still these outdated theories around Heidegelder. We, we know that uh, all the Chinese, uh, all the, the Malays came from China. Everything came from China, according to these old scholars. But now there is new evidence from DNA analysis uh, that uh, partly due to climate change, sea level rise, there was a lot of migration in the area, and which was more or less a circular <coughs> migration uh, around the South China Sea area. And actually, part of South China was settled also by Austronesian-speaking peoples. So early Malays, if you want to call it, early Bumiputras. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm quoting some of these sources. So uh, looking at the Chinese position, there are so many maps. Uh, there, there are many. Uh, historical evidences, but uh, Malays has an oral tradition of referring to coastlines, rocks, and so on. And these can be researched typically by anthropologists and sociologists you know, who concentrate on interviews with the actors there. Yeah. Another uh, interesting point is how a Mediterranean sea is being created. And this is my current research interests around the South China Sea, uh, increasing labor migration, uh, increasing connectivity across the South China Sea as a socio-cultural area, more internet connections. You know, that, uh, that, that this is a map of the cables that are there now. Uh, and um, then there are other types of connection like research cooperation. This is uh, Science Incorporation 1990 to 2000. Uh, that means uh, joint research being done by uh, the uh, various universities uh, around the South China Sea. I see that UNESCO is listening to this. Um, <coughs> and uh, this situation has changed dramatically in the past 10 years. Uh, where Singapore has emerged as the science center and Taiwan and uh, southern China as the counterpart. So most of the joint research is now 
around the South China Sea and on the South China Sea is done in cooperation with uh, some of the big universities from Singapore to uh, Fudan and uh, um, Taiwan National University, etc. Okay, let me come to a conclusion. Now, uh, as I have shown, uh, legitimate claims to the resources of the South China Sea may be based on social historical facts, like uh, in UNCLOS Article 15. So that has to be pursued. Uh, the Chinese claims are basically based on old maps and old tests of historical evidence. Uh, Spatial content, concepts are used to lay claim to the South China Sea in terms of naming. I mean, they have been the advantage of Chinese because it's called the South China Sea. In, in Chinese, it's called, normally they use Nanhai, which is Southern Sea. But uh, the Europeans use it, the sea south of China. So the Philippines said, OK, this is the Western Philippine Sea. And um, the um, Vietnamese, I can't speak Vietnamese, but they ha also have a concept, a name for the South China Sea. What about Malay? Lao Tsina Selata. That's a translation of the English one. Eh? No own concept, not Nusantara Sea or, or something like that. So uh, the, the battle of concepts is quite important, and it's an interesting study uh, that could be done Nusantara um, as a new concept covering the South China Sea. The battle of words and historical claims is on. So governing South China Sea Nusantara model, socio-cultural traditions are important, and that's where we come in as social scientists. And a Nusantara model of sharing resources, of differentiated according to types of resources, and what is uh, sort of from a Malay conception of space is quite possible. No, why not have an arrangement? The fish belong to one country, the oil to another one. Yeah? I mean, in, in, in terms of European or, Ch or even Chinese conceptual space, impossible, you know, because space is fixed. But, uh, uh, from a Nusantara point of view, okay, why not? Like the, the Sultanate of Yogyakarta, one desa is, belongs to Solo, the next one belongs to Yogyakarta. So it's chatted. So why not resource sharing, uh, which would be, I think, quite acceptable from a Nusantara point of view. So social science research on the South China Sea as a social cultural areas, historical linguistic research on the concept and meaning of Nusantara is really necessary to support Malaysia's claim to the South China Sea resources. And this should also be an agenda for Prasatta and Science Social Malaysia and convince uh, the Ministry of Education to give a lot of research funds to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, for Hans. Um, and I, I remember reading about two weeks ago a paper by Professor Rahman um, from, from a source, from a historical source. He, he mentioned uh, the Sea of Malayu and the Sea of Malayu. Uh, would uh, would that term be appropriate to describe the South China Sea? Question, please. Can I answer this question? <laughs> uh, the Sea of Malayo was first, uh, the term was mentioned in an uh, Arabic text, uh, actually. And the question was whether it is uh, uh, applied to the Straits of Malacca or, or beyond. And it's found in a, a paper written by uh, Andaya, historian from uh, ABU. Question? Professor 
Thank you, Bahans. We have added one more agenda for the Malaysian Social Science Association to take up besides the one that I raised yesterday. I think this is a very good challenge and a very interesting agenda for the new president and her team to take up. Uh, I just want to add on to the Sea of Malayu concept that Pak Alim and Pak Hans mentioned just now. And my source is, of course, Andaya. And that, according to his interpretation of the Sea of Malayu, it's not just the Straits of Malacca. It is called the Voyaging Passage that connects the Nusantara region with uh, the, the Bay of Bengal right through to the South China Sea. But whether the South China Sea was regarded as the Sea of Malayu or not in that document is still open for interpretation. But I think your challenge um, early on for, the, for social scientists to undertake social research in looking into the concept of Nusantara as a so social cultural concept to look into the conceptions of space, I think will be variable from the perspective of the historical uh, understandings or claims or you know historical seas, so to speak, uh, as one of the basis of uh, legitimate claims under UNCLOS. And I think this is one of the weakest links in, Malay in Malaysian and Southeast Asian historiography that we don't have documents to support that. You suggested oral tradition, interviewing the sea farers and all that. The question is that their memories may not extend beyond to the earlier periods that can be regarded as having their historical legitimacy. Any your, your response to that? Said, okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, well, um, I showed you the uh, pictures of these rocks, you know, which uh, has a, uh, an airfield or some helicopter landing space. Uh, the Chinese even used one of these rocks and put a hotel and say this is a tourist destination. <laughs> 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 So you can book a trip there now. <laughs> now, if uh, documents do not exist, you create documents in the same way as you create islands out of rocks. So um, if you go and interview uh, fishermen and uh, seafarers, uh, and they tell you this island is called so and so, this island is so, and we do these courses, and we have been going there. My father has already been going there, and so on. Then you write a scientific paper. You publish either in a one-tier Scopus journal, you get extra points, or in <laughs> academia, or in the social science uh, review, the new one of uh, your, uh, the, to be revived, I understand. Uh, and then it's a document which can be produced in court yeah, because it's based on scientific research. So in the same way as you create islands out of rocks, you create uh, documents out of your research and in interviews. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, very good morning, Fahans. Thank you for a very interesting um, um, keynote this morning. And I like the last part of your keynote. That is a challenge for PSSM. Yeah? But I really, uh, this is not a question, but really uh, a responsibility that should be shared with um, all that are present this morning. Um, when PSSM um, want to ask for big money for projects like you have mentioned. Um, we are not representing one or two universities. 
So there are bosses in this hall. There are deans, uh, deputy deans, head of programs, and head of uh, departments. Um, I'm from um, UKM. I'm the chair of the School of History, Politics, and Strategy, and I do teach military programs. I teach political science. My problem is when we go into disciplines, that is the problem when we ask for big money. When we want to get universities to cooperate, they don't cross boundaries. They don't do much of multidisciplinary research, and it's a problem. I'm a political economist. I go multidiscipline. It's easy for me to get money from different sources. I do urge the deans, deputy deans, head of programs or departments to have uh, as much as multidisciplinary courses. So that will help the SSM. And I'm here talking as the deputy president, helping uh, Rashila to get money for all of us. Yeah? We hope to get uh, as much um, programs that's going into multidisciplinary. That will help us a lot. All right? Okay, thank you for having me. Thank you uh, for a colleague from UKM for saying that we all have responsibility. Jangan lupa Sabah, yeah? <laughs> Sebab, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, Spanish chronicles uh, that are housed either in Manila or in Spain uh, about uh, early terminologies because some, like Pigafetta, for example, the historian, sailed all the way to Sumatra and Java and the island of Boni, they call it. So what are the names he uses, uh, uh, Malay names that he used for the seas that he crossed? In fact, he met what he called a Filipino in Java when actually a Malay, <laughs> you know, uh, he confused Filipino and Malay. Maybe there was no distinction in the Nusantara at that time. And if there was no distinction in terms of ethnic categories or racial categories, maybe in Spanish uh, chronicles, uh, there would be Malay names Hello. recorded by a Spanish historian. Uh, so uh, at the University of Malaysia Sabah, there, not just Trunganu, uh, there is a, a Borneo Res Marine Research Institute. It's full of uh, uh, marine biologists. Uh, there is no social scientist yet, but we are trying to penetrate. The social scientists are trying to penetrate this very uh, ultra. So uh, we have the same problem as you, trying to work uh, transdisciplinary. Uh, but I don't think it's an impossible problem. We can, we can try. Uh, we are trying at University of Malaysia Sabah. And then recently there was a formation because of the so-called Suluk intrusion. I don't want to say it's a, uh, you know, a, a, other words being used, but intrusion is politically safe. Um, uh, there is a center for security studies. And uh, I think uh, if it is div driven by policy, this kind of academic research into uh, uh, terminologies and uh, uh, ethnicities and uh, natural resources could counter uh, the political or policy orientation of a lot of interest in the Sulu, Sulawesi marine region, eco region, which makes part of the Nusantara the way you described it. So I think that the Sabah scholarship uh, linking especially with Mindanao and uh, Sulawesi using Spanish sources, if you want to have PhD students doing that, could also be an aspect of, uh, of the research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm really interested in the concept from the point of view of public culture, because I think we have seen in Malaysia, um,
in the development of the music industry in Malaysia, we have seen uh, protagonists in the music industry like Mananga and Nase, who actively have been promoting the notion of Balada Nusantara, uh, essentially looking at the hybridization in terms of the fusion of between different musical genres that have taken place predating nation states in the Nusantara region. So looking at that particular template uh, as, as, a, as a fusion of pop culture, and even say in the film Putih Gunung Ledang, you can see that the version done by um, 